sorry, we don't have a set agenda for today. We're kind of going to go in whatever direction people want. Um, I am going to keep people muted for the um, time today, but also um, if you have any questions, feel free, you can raise your hand. There's a button somewhere to do that or better yet, just type in the chat button. If you type any questions in the chat button, we'll be for sure to answer them. But otherwise, um, thank you very much for joining us. I will be uploading this to YouTube probably tomorrow at some point. So if you miss anything or have to leave, you can always check it out there. But otherwise, I'm gonna give it over to Dr. Michael Leibowitz, who's gonna be talking today. Mainly it's gonna be a, a question and answer thing. It's neat to see some faces I haven't seen in, in decades. Um, anyway, it's funny, back in, um, back when I graduated chiropractic school, I took a trip over to, <clears throat> to the Big Island with a friend of mine. And um, if you go to the west side of the Big Island, at least back in the 1980s, the whole ro road was littered with like squashed noni fruit. And it used to just stink because it, it, it would just smell like Limburger cheese. And um, the other thing that was plentiful on that side of the island were, were sea cucumbers. They were like all over the place too and all the tidal pools. And we used to joke that if we could find a way to turn noni into a supplement, we could convince people to use it, we could get rid of the stink on the west side of the island. Um, that being said, I, I never had any aspirations to get into a, a supplement business. When I was in chiropractic school, at least at Western States, we had to visit a um, supplement factory. And we visited one in Portland. And um, after that, I decided not to use supplements for quite a while because I, I was just kind of um, aghast at some of the things that they were doing in the company. But as, as I started to um, learn AK and then I started developing techniques. And those of you that have known me for a while, I started teaching with Wally Schmidt back in the 1980s as I was developing techniques about candida albicans and other fungal infections and ways to discern food reactivity and so forth. Um, I, I started using a lot of products and I, I was getting influential, which wasn't necessarily what I wanted, but um, I ran into a company back then um, called Thorne Research. And Thorne is a different company now It's because it's, it's owned by totally different people. I think there's only one person on staff who has been on for long and no one back then. And I, I helped Thorne formulate some products. If any of you ever used a product called Berber Cap that was from me or we had um, Coptis, we had Isatis, we had a my Neil product. And I was doing that with Thorn. Um, I was doing a little bit of quality control for them. And um, we were using a lot of their products. And then um, in 1987, our family went to Kauai. I, I have a big Hawaii history that goes way back. And we were just going to Kauai on vacation to visit friends. And um, my, a friend of mine who lives in Hanalei there, has a taro farm. And he called me up and he said, I can't get any workers. I need someone to help me harvest the taro. Can you come over? And I said, sure. And so Cynthia and the boys dropped me off. They went to a zip line. And so I got there and my friend Mike, who runs a taro farm said, you know, thank you for being here. The things I didn't tell you are, one is you're gonna probably get leptospirosis today from working here. And the second thing that's going to happen is if you step on one of the plentiful snails in the water, it might cut your toe off. Um, meantime, everyone had left. So I was kind of stuck there and um, worked there all day. My friend Mike, who said he was immune, ended up with leptospirosis and I didn't get it. And I was trying to figure out, you know, is this just random or not? The only thing I'd been doing different in my life then was we had been to a health food store in Kauai about a week previously and I bought some dried noni fruit. And um, I was eating it. I didn't know much about it. I just buy weird stuff and eat it usually if I see it. And we thought maybe that has something to do with it. So when we got back to Colorado, 
I pulled out my um, couple of my kits. I had fungal kits and other kits, and we were testing with them, and we saw that um, dried noni had very strong antimicrobial properties, especially when it wasn't fermented, when it was picked a little bit early. And so I ordered some from different places. I ordered some from the Big Island, and I ordered some from Guam, and I ordered some from India and other places. And we found that, you know, depending on where it was grown, how it was harvested, some of them locked our findings and some of them didn't. And um, I wanted to make a supplement out of it because of its antimicrobial properties. And um, at that point, um, Thorne was heading in a different direction and they weren't really interested in doing something like that. And I, I called a friend of mine who ran a company called Mid-American Marketing. And I said, Gail, would you like to make this product? I said, you'd have to make it to my specifications, which means no fillers, no binders, no excipients, no anything other than the herb and the capsule. He said, you know, let me see if I can find a company that'll do that. And he searched basically the whole US. I think there was one company he found at that point in Utah. And what we did was we ordered five or six raw materials. Again, one from Guam, one from the Big Island, maybe one from India. Um, and I blind tested and I just kept data. You know, vial number one, you know, worked on so many patients, vial number two on another. And the one that tested the best is what we purchased. Cost didn't matter. It was just a matter of which one tested the best, assuming that they all, which they did have very similar um, COAs. And COAs are what you get from the lab, which tells you the micro count, the toxic metal count. It's if you, um, look at companies and they say they're a GMP approved facility, which basically every company has to be, unless you want to just make sales within your state. Um, that's what they do. They, they take these labs um, about three times during the processing of a supplement. But we took it a step further and we were using, it had to of course pass that, but it had to pass our AK evaluation. And then we would do that um, we started sharing with some of the AK community and they were giving us feedback on how well it worked compared to other products of the same plant. And at that point, our, our company, it wasn't actually my company, it was Gail's company. I, I was just um, advising, was born. And, and was born to help my patients, myself, and others within the AK community. That was basically the goal. And what happened is as I was doing my research, if anything new came out, like this was a time where Dr. Becker's book w was popular and everyone started getting aware of electromagnetic fields. So we started testing people on different um, electromagnetic radiation exposures, cell phones, maybe our percussor, whatever it happened to be, and we would test people. And if it caused um, deafferentation, is that the right word, Noah? Uh, yeah. Of, of a muscle, you know, or, you know, what old school AK people might call, quote, a weakening. Um, we would test different raw herbs and see what blocked it. I had, you know, over 100 different raw herbs in, in our office. And I, I've told this before, but we were expecting kudzu to work because kudzu grows up electric lines all over the southeast. And we were thinking there must be a reason for that. But kudzu didn't work, and a product called Philanthus fraternus, which is also called... Um, Stonebreaker, and it's also called Chanka Piedra. That blocked really well. And that was our second product. And that we found, um, we found people that were sensitive to electromagnetic fields did much better and were less sensitive if they were taking it. We hypothesized it maybe it was strengthening the pineal gland, but somehow it was upping tolerance. And so we were just slowly adding things to our inventory. We weren't um, interested in reproducing something that was good. We didn't have to come out with black walnut. There's plenty of good black walnuts. We didn't have to come out with echinacea. There's plenty of good echinaceas out there. Um, but different things that fill different niches. And as people have been getting sicker and as microbes have been becoming more and more of an issue, um, we obviously were focusing on antimicrobials. Also with the chemical load in people and the metal load just increasing for a myriad of reasons, which we talk about in our seminars. Um, we wanted things that were really good detox products. Um, we wanted things that were organ restorative, but also 
realizing that if you didn't um, get rid of dysbiosis, if you didn't take them off the things were inflaming them, the organs just aren't going to restore, that that would kind of be step two in the process in a sense. And um, so over the years, you know, it's grown to maybe 35 different products. Um, Gail, who owned the company, retired, and we were faced with a dilemma. We could go the way of Garden of Life and Pure Encapsulations and people and sell out to someone like Nestle, but that, that really wasn't an option in my mind because it wasn't, again, it wasn't so much a profit-driven company. It was more to help patients. And, and so, and I, did, I definitely didn't want the work of owning a company. I have enough going on. So my son over there, he decided to, to buy it from Gail just so we could maintain control of, of quality and so forth. And that's, um, that's pretty much how it got to where it is. So like I mentioned, if people have any questions, please, the easiest way is just type it in the chat button. But I know one thing you mentioned was, you know, we're not going to come out with black walnut necessarily because there's a lot of other good black walnuts. So why did you want to come out with a green product with wild greens when there is probably a thousand green products out there? Okay. Um, there are a couple of things. One is a greens product is, can also somewhat be based on what's not in it. One thing we didn't want to do is put in any plant that eventually has a gliadin or gluten content. Because a lot of times what happens, even if it's a young plant and the gluten content is almost immeasurable, your body recognizes, okay, wheat's coming in or barley's coming in, and it makes that association. And people will have a reaction to it, even if the content is very low. So we didn't want any gluten grain grasses in there. We didn't want... Um, any algaes in there because a lot of algaes sometimes have excitotoxins, which a lot of our patients don't do well. And we didn't want to have alfalfa, which a lot of people put in their greens product basically because it's cheap. But the Gerson Clinic in Mexico, you know, that treats cancer and does it with lots of juices and so forth, um, found that in their patients, if they gave them alfalfa, they never got over their autoimmune conditions. So we wanted to take alfalfa out. So we wanted something, and we also wanted something ideally that you could go forage out in the wild. So um, being someone who used to live in the Pacific Northwest on different occasions, we used to go and forage our greens and forage our salads and different things. And so um, we partnered in a sense with Eclectic Institute. You know, we told them what we wanted, which were products that they don't, except for one of the ingredients, they don't really sell them, but they said, you know, they knew places they could harvest for us and freeze dries for us. So together we ended up coming out with, with wild greens. And if you look at other things, like you, know, you might buy the spirulina products, some of them are even white in color, like the green content is negligible. You know, our stuff, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it tastes like you mowed the lawn. Um, the guy that runs this building where we're living he was buying one of those green products and I just said, hey, you know, take ours. And I came upstairs and I brought down a bottle for him. And now he's like hooked on it just because it's so much more vital for him. You know, and, and in terms of that, you know, there, are, have, there have been a couple of products that are, you know, were already out there like ashwagandha. But ashwagandha never tested for me. And I, you know, I wasn't sure why, you know, was it a quality thing? was it that most of them are standardized extracts. And so, you know, one day I got lots of different ashwagandhas and I found one that tested really well. We sent it to a bunch of other practitioners we liked and said, you know, try this out, see what you think compared to other ashwagandhas and get back to us. And they were all really impressed. So when we thought that we could really up the quality of something that was on the market, we would do that. And sometimes we've been unsuccessful. Um, people have asked us to come out with a rhodiola product. I haven't found a rhodiola raw material that tests really well. So that's one reason we don't have it. So, you know, we're always getting raw materials in, um, always testing them, you know, trying to learn about things. You know, we want things that both have a good background in the scientific literature, 
but also a really strong um, track record of either blocking indicators or doing other things from an AK standpoint. Since we don't have any questions yet, do you want to talk just a little bit about Artemisia? I know that's a product you've used for decades and it was traditionally an extract versus the whole herb. Um, again, sometimes in our desire to increase antimicrobials and, um, you know, different parasitic things going on and artemisinin being used a lot in the Lyme community, a lot of the research said that the whole dried product worked better than the standardized extract of artemisinin. And um, so we got some straight artemisia annua, the whole thing dried and we started testing it and also testing it. There, it goes through a number of steps, which I'll talk about, but it ended up performing better. And we just decided, you know, this is worthwhile because there's really no one that we were aware of on the market just selling whole dried artemisia annua. I mean, what happens when we think about a product is we get raw materials, First, I wanted to, for those who are AK docs out there, I wanted to strengthen a weak indicator muscle on the majority of people. Um, and after that, I want to see if it blocks certain findings that we find, whatever it's indicated for. And then there's the last step. The last step is giving it to a series of people and seeing if it gives a desired effect. Like until Shadavari, we were looking for years and years for a hormone balancing product. We found many that tested good, blocked indicators, but then when we gave it to our patients, there was no symptom change. So we decided, you know, we're not gonna do this. So we needed to, it, it needs to go through all of those steps. Um, and sometimes things would just drop in our lap. Wally said that it's always good to tell stories. I know he likes to tell jokes, but I prefer to tell stories. Um, my other son, Josiah, lived in Japan. And when he was in Japan, he called me one day and he said, you know, have you ever heard of um, Takasumi? And I said, no. And he said, well, I was watching the show Yakatate Japan, because he was always watching anime. And they had an episode on who could make the healthiest bread and the people at one made Takasumi bread. And I said, okay, why don't you find some for me? Mean term, meanwhile, I was looking it up. I found out that they were using Takasumi in Indonesia on cancer patients. They were using it for radiation absorption, for toxin absorption. Um, even they were putting, putting out stalks of it to help with electromagnetic radiation. It's you know, hard to know how much it worked on some of those things, but he sent me some and it tested really, really well. And then when Josiah came back to the US, um, we started playing with it. He loves baking and he started putting Takasumi in bread. And he found that, you know, some people who were gluten intolerant tolerated gluten way more, or just much better than they did without Takasumi in it. We found over in the UK, they would actually make spoons out of pressed Takasumi to use in your coffee because it helped mitigate some of the effects of the caffeine. For our use, which would, I started taking it and I, I was having a lot of um, leftover numbness from amalgam removal on the left side of my face, down my ulnar distribution, sometimes down into my big toe. And I'd made progress with DMSA back when it was um, a non-prescription item, but it only took me so far. And I started taking Takasumi and it took me way up to another plateau. And so we started using it. At this point, it's one of the major binders in the Lyme community. Um, and we have two forms actually. The stuff in the powder comes from Japan and, and it's made by a method that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, we're a little concerned because we don't know if the next generation is gonna take it over or not. And we only have access to so much of it because unfortunately, a lot of it's used in the confection industry as a black dye. But we, 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 can, own, we can get, you know, we get some and um, that's our powder. Since 
it became popular enough, we, we found another, most of it comes from China and most of it doesn't test well. Um, we did find a source in Korea that does test well and the encapsulated form is from Korea. So for those of you that muscle test, you should test both on patients because sometimes one tests and not the other. Um, it, it'll vary. Um, some patients will test for both. Occasionally people test on neither one. One thing to know about it too, in a small percentage of people, it will constipate. So some people might need a little bit extra magnesium at a different time than the Takasumi if it tends to constipate. We had a couple questions. Um, Carrie asked, does it, um, Artemisia is known to neg negatively affect mental state? Um, obviously, answer, I don't believe so at all. I don't think you know of any negative mental states, do you? I haven't had any patients that that's been an issue. We had two other questions. One was from Dr. Locke. Um, was there ever a product that you found effective for patient issues that was never mentioned in the literature for that issue? Like Bodyguard. You know, Bodyguard we use for electromagnetic radiation. It also, this is a little bit esoteric, but it also tends, like if you're a practitioner that gets affected by your patients just because of the energy they're given off, it tends to be self-protective for the practitioner if they take it. That's why we have that shield on the cover of it. That's kind of what it represented. There are lots of things like Vidanga, which is probably my second favorite antimicrobial, even though it's not particularly popular in sales, but it tests almost as good as, well, it doesn't test as good as Malia, but it tests better than all the others. That's in the, in the literature, it's mainly for worms, but we found it's a very effective antifungal, antibacterial, antiviral, um, you know, herbs are so interesting because, you know, it's not like, um, you know, say a vitamin, which might, you know, f you know, fill two pathways, like tyrosine turns into, you know, it turns into thyroxine and it turns into epinephrine. I mean, most herbs can have 10 or 20 different indications. And, you know, some of them are minor. So it's, it's not unusual for us to find that something works in, quote, an outside of the box indication, you know, which again, we just find as we're working on, on patients. Vidang is the one that comes to mind most, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's other things. Takasumi has been an antimicrobial, or, or you might find that Larong works good for something you had no idea it would. You know, it, it's pretty common. Well, yeah. It's interesting too. There's so many research articles out there that we haven't even read. Sometimes people that have taken our products will send us one, and it's really interesting because they're finding new things about herbs all the time. Right, like Bodyguard with Babesia. Or um, we're, it, at ICAK next week, we're presenting a, a paper, and part of the presentation is on oxalic acid. And, you know, there's a lot of people who have joint pains or even almost any autoimmune condition that are very oxalic acid sensitive. And we really weren't sure what to do about it. And um, Keith McAllister, who was, was one of the people that formulate for Supreme, um, he's been wanting for years for us to come out with Uber Ursi. And um, I just said, nah, the niche is too small because we're a small company. We don't sell a lot of bottles of things, but he kept hounding and, and so, and he said, you know, a lot of CDSAs, when you send to um, Genova and some of the other labs, they always say that um, Uber Ursi is indicated, you know, that it makes a zone of inhibition in the Petri dish. So we said, okay. And then when we started finding oxalic acid on a lot of our patients with this way that we're going to demo next week, um, we started just randomly testing different things to see what negated it. And the thing that negated it, like something like 94% of the time, which wasn't particularly expected on our part, was Uber Ursi. And it, and it appears to help stop um, deposition of oxalic acid or different oxalates in, in human tissue. So, you know, and it encourages excretion. You know, so again, it, it was a little bit of an outside the box indicator that we weren't expecting. Um, Scott Forrest is going to ask two questions. One's probably shorter, so I'll ask that first. Some suggest that rosemary can also be protective with EMFs. Have you seen rosemary supreme test against EMFs? To be 100% honest, I have never tested it, but I will. So thank you for that um, tidbit. 
I know I've read recently too, some places are saying how Noni or Mirinda can be helpful against EMFs. I don't know where they got that from and I haven't tested that either, but it could be worth it. And one, one thing, and this is only for the muscle testing docs, but you have to understand what a muscle test means. So let's say that I have a raging fungal issue and the fungal issue makes me food sensitive and the fungal issue lowers my vitamin B6 levels and as a result makes me sensitive to EMFs. So my EMFs in this case are a secondary um, total load exposure type of thing. Now, if I were to see what blocks it, I mean, bodyguard probably would, but so would something that blocks the fungus because the fungus is kind of an up road cause. You know, if we got rid of the fungus, then I wouldn't have the food sensitivities, I wouldn't lower my P5P levels and my EMF exposure wouldn't bother me. So, you know, what blocks on a muscle test might get to an underlying cause, you know, so you, you can also draw conclusions, okay, Mirinda would be great for um, EMFs, you know, but is it directly or is it maybe taking care of another cause that's making the person be more sensitive? I don't know the answer to that, but I wouldn't be surprised either way. Scott also asked, can you talk about how you might approach hypercoagulation with your products? And outside of muscle testing, what might lead you to Don Shen versus Hemoguard versus something else like Baluk? And is there any risk of over thinning your blood with Don Shen or Hemoguard? Give me the first part first. Let's take it one part. Um, how you might approach hypercoagulation with your products. Um, again, a lot of times hypercoagulation is secondary to microbes or metals. So just kind of put that in the background. Um, when, you know, a lot of you know that I had hypercoagulation issues and secondary to an unknown infection of some type, which had very COVID-like symptoms 10 years ago, I ended up with multiple pulmonary embolisms in each lobe of my lung on two different occasions. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm definitely aware of the Luke. I went to see Dr. Um, Martin Wong, I believe, in British Columbia, who was one of the experts on Baluk and, um, to examine my blood. You know, Baluk has a relatively short half-life. I think it's a good product. It's a very expensive product. There are many of us that aren't in favor of eating things that are worm-derived, you know, if you're kosher or if you're a you know, vegetarian. And um, so, we first came out with HemoGuard where we just were making kind of a combo product, you know, and it had some things like um, papaya leaf, which has anticoagulant properties, ginger. There's research on ginger that if you eat a fatty meal, your fibrinogen levels will go up, you know, significantly. But if you put ginger in the meal and eat the same, you know, say fried piece of meat, um, your fibrinogen levels actually go down if there's been ginger as part of the meal. We put ginger in, we put ginkgo in. Um, I think there's one other thing that's eluding my memory at the moment that's might papaya be in. Leaf. Which one? Papaya leaf? No, I said papaya leaf. Oh, okay. That, I mean, ideally, I like one ingredient products, which we'll talk about a little later. But this one had multiple ingredients. I hadn't known about Don Shen at that point. And when I heard about Don Shen, because it works on both sides of the coagulation pathway, it both breaks down clotting material. And at the same time, it tends to balance it so your body's not making too much. Um, I was really impressed with it. And I personally like Don Shen better. There are some people definitely where HemoGuard is um, indicated instead. Um, Don Shen also has other cardiac indicators. Um, I had one, I, of all the years we've had HemoGuard around, one person was overdosing and they claimed that it might, it might have caused a little bit of a rupture in the, one of the you know, small capillaries in their eye so that you, know, you could see like a little burst capillary in their eye when they took too much HemoGuard. Um, so theoretically that's possible. Another thing, after my pulmonary embolisms, and everybody told me I needed to take um, prescription 
anti, well, anticoagulants. And this was including every top functional medicine doctor, top AK guys. They all said, you got to do the prescriptions. Your case was just too bad. And I did take the prescription for a while until it led to other issues. And I stopped. And um, I started doing a lot of herbal antimicrobials. We live in Hawaii. I was buying fresh ginseng. I was buying fresh turmeric root. I was buying fresh ginger. And I was just loading up on those things. And I used to go down to um, Ala Moana Beach Park. And they have one of those exercise places on the beach. And the benches are made of like um, metal with like a rubberized coating, you know, with like many holes in it. Um, you know, so it's just kind of that's the design, lots of little holes. Anyway, I came back from exercising and my wife looked in my back and I just had like hundreds of, of little um, circles of, of redness. It's almost like I you know, needed an exorcist. It was just so weird. We couldn't figure out what it was because it was very symmetrical. And it turned out just the pressure of laying on my back with taking all those herbi herbal antimicrobials was causing you know, probably um, slight bruising all over the place. So you can overdo them, but you, know, you really have to be doing a lot to overdo them. But you know, if your patients have a tendency to, to bruise easy, you know, you might also think, well, maybe they should be, you know, maybe they're low in something in the seat complex or, you know, or maybe something else. But, you know, it, it's been so rare. That one and my patient with the eye were the only two um, I've had feedback like that. Do you want to briefly mention of why you typically, besides Baluk and the worm aspect, why you don't typically like different um, proteolytic enzymes? and you'd rather use like a doctor. Yes. So my second bout of pulmonary embolisms happened two years after my first. And I have a, um, a neuroma on my foot that no one's been able to help much for. And I was scouring the internet. And like most people, I occasionally take advice from Dr. Google, which is, I have mixed feelings about that. And so some nature path said, all you need for neuroma is to load up on serapeptase. So I thought, okay, sounds good. I order serapeptase and I start taking it. It actually made my, my neuroma feel a little bit better. And within a couple of weeks, I relapsed that unknown virus and then I relapsed my pulmonary embolisms. And what I believe happened and, and what a lot of um, leading doctors like Ann Corson, some other doctors that I talked to back then, we feel that you know, the first time I had them, I never completely got rid of that microbe and a lot of it got tied up in biofilms. And when I started taking the serapeptase, what happened was I broke down the biofilms and I let the microbes loose that caused the embolisms in the first place and I relapsed. And the way I tell it is like, if you were to look at a maximum security prison, um, taking an enzyme because most of the enzymes aren't very strong antimicrobials. Baluk has some antimicrobial properties. But most of them aren't very strong. It's like basically pushing the button and opening up all the doors. You've broken down, you know, if you look at the doors, like being biofilm. If, um, there's a lot of research about um, using essential oils to break down biofilms. There's research in um, the medical literature. There's research in the book of Leviticus. I wrote a book called God Preventative Medicine, which a lot of it's based on the instructions in Leviticus that deal with biofilms and fungi and stuff. Anyway, um, essential oils break down biofilms, but they also tend to kill the microbes inside. So it'd be like in that maximum security prison, opening up the doors, but having a guard there to shoot the prisoner before they can wreak havoc. So that's why we, we found um, essential oils and we started giving them to people. And personally, I was um, skeptical that topical essential oils would do much. But we started getting feedback by some physician friends. Some said, oh yeah, I gave it to a patient and the patient used to get you know, prostate infections all the time. And now for the first time in 20 years, they don't have prostate infections. Um, there've been some doctors that have rubbed it on the lumbar spine and gotten 30 extra degrees of lumbar flexion. 
you know, we had one person with alopecia who would rub it on their head and their hair grew back. And sometimes people don't notice any difference, though it still could be theoretically working on breaking down the biofilms. So we, we do use that. Um, and again, from just a safety standpoint, because I don't want to have anyone go through what I did with my pulmonary embolism. So the proteolytic enzymes um, scare me a little bit. So I've never asked you this question before, but I know one thing you say is people are much more sick now than they were 40 years ago when you first started practice. So how does Supreme Nutrition and the herbs help with those people that are sicker? If that makes sense. I mean, people are sicker in one sense. Like, you know, if, if you went back, um, you know, they found Lyme disease in mummies. You know, I mean, things existed. We're just weaker. You know, we have a, a generation in my generation who, you know, were, were exposed to things that were never, you know, they were never exposed to before. You know, our carpets were made of, out of synthetics. You know, our furniture came from formaldehyde. You know, people were using pesticides in their gardens way more than the generation before. You know, then suddenly you get into Noah's generation and you have all the vaccinations you know, we didn't have as many and you have all the electromagnetic radiation. You have, um, you know, all of the population growth. So there's, you know, lots of more excavation. So they're unearthing all kinds of funguses in the soil. They're mining rare earth metals to make your cell phone and, and you know, all of the dust getting into the air from that mining that's blowing all over the planet. So basically people are not adapting really well, especially those with um, some gene snips that might make them express. And in general, there had, in general, if you look at third world cultures, they intuitively had antimicrobials built into their life. Um, some of these examples aren't third world, and it doesn't really matter what world, but just, um, it's just the third world people in some ways are above us because they didn't forget the things that we've forgotten put aside. Um, but you go to Korea, you know, traditional Koreans who haven't been westernized might eat kimchi with every meal. Um, some of them have special kimchi refrigerators, you know, just for kimchi. Um, in Japan, you know, what do they do with their um, sushi? They put wasabi on it all because wasabi is a grain anti-parasitic. You might go to Russia and they would use garlic on everything. Um, you, you might go to other countries and they use um, super hot peppers on everything because they're all antimicrobials built into the diet. You know, a lot of our Western diets are much um, tamer and we, we don't go for antimicrobials. Plus, we have a much more international diet. We have food that we're exposed to on a much more international level, our meat could come from South America, it could come from Asia, our vegetables might come from South America or Asia, or you might be getting Brussels sprouts, which most of them come from the Netherlands. So we're exposed to microbes on a much broader level. So it can be advantageous to take some of those traditional antimicrobials that come from those different parts of the world and include them in our regimens, either dietarily or supplementary so that we can um, stay, you know, one step above those microbes. And what's interesting about antimicrobials, you know, like um, my friend Wally Schmidt, he he's really likes teaching about cytokines and he teaches about, you know, interleukins and Th1 and Th2 and all kinds of different immune markers and immune modulators. You know, I might teach about this herb's a great antifungal you know, he might give the exact same herb like scutellaria. I might give it because it's an antifungal. He might give it because it lowers TH17, which might be raised by a fungus. But, you know, he's, he's going at it from a different direction. I'm going at it from a different direction. In some ways, we come out with the same place because herbs are amazing immune modulators. If you start looking and doing the research on immune modulation of a particular herb, you know, if they've done enough research, which a lot of them actually have, it's incredible how it works on both ends, you know, so it's, it's not only like you give a, um, a nutraceutical, you know, that might end up helping 
lower TH2, but you might give an herb that not only lowers TH2, but it's also a broad spectrum antiparasitic. So herbs tend to be better in my opinion in most cases than specific nutrients. So nutrients are indicated on occasion. Carrie had asked, do you believe old viruses can be released over time as your body heals? Old viruses can be released as your body is weak. As your body heals, um, I don't know, I'd have to think about that. Not necessarily. I think your body would ideally take care of it if it's really healing. Do you want to talk about multi-herb versus single herb products, or do you want to talk, tell a story about like Lou Rong and Adam? Um, I like single herb products. And the reason is you go into Whole Foods, you go to a lot of doctor's offices, you say you want to do a parasite cleanse. So you get a, you get a pill with 20 different ingredients in it. Problem is if you were to test all 20 ingredients, maybe four of them have any effect against the particular microbe you have. Fifth, you know, 12 of them might um, have no effect. Four of them might be deleterious. So your body would actually have an inflammatory reaction or some um, reactivity reaction. So you give the product, it might muscle test okay because it really needs those four, but the amount is, you know, it's only four of 20 ingredients. So the amount in there is not enough to do the job. Um, plus their body, when they take it, might start reacting to those four that they're reactive to and might, the inflammation, you know, might tend to make other things worse. So what I tend to do is I check single antimicrobials and whichever one seems strongly indicated, I give. So if a person has multiple dysbiotic issues, I might give three different antimicrobials, but again, each one's a single ingredient. So I've tailor made it to fit that particular patient. I know the single herb probably can be a little frustrating at times for functional medical docs because we don't just have an antifungal blend or an antiparasitic blend, but for the muscle testing crowd, especially, it can be really beneficial because you're only giving exactly what the person needs. And, and one thing that I've been harping on, and I mean, I use functional medicine, but you have to realize the difference sometimes. I mean, in in muscle testing, you're treating reactivity. You're finding things that are causing neurologic reactivity, and you're giving things that restore the body from a state of neurologic reactivity to neurologic homeostasis. In functional medicine, oftentimes you're treating lab results. And, you know, a person, there might be two people with um, plus three gamma strep, in one person it's normal, in one person it's causing a lot of issues. There might be one person with a, a very small amount of mercury, but the person might be so reactive that it's significant and another person might have 10 times that level and it's not significant. So I, I, I like functional med labs sometimes to monitor um, progress in terms of amount, but I think treating reactivity is even more important. If you have any other questions, we still have a few more minutes. So is there anything else you want to cover specifically? Um, I'll see if someone has questions first, otherwise I'm happy to talk. Hmm. Let's keep chatting while people, oh, um, can you talk a little bit about solanine toxicity? Um, you know, that's become a pretty big issue now that like the um, autoimmune paleo diet is anti-nightshades. Um, you know, most of us know that most nightshade vegetables have multiple um, plant toxins in them. They have lectins, they have alpha-solanine, a lot of them have nicotine, they have, um, oh, Scott can tell me the name that's eluding my memory at the moment. But um, there's, I think there's five different um, neurotoxic substances within something like a tomato. Um, you know, the, the less ripe, the higher the solanine content. So a green tomato would be a lot more toxic than a red tomato or a potato with some green on it. Um, in terms of, you know, it's very toxic to some of the animal kingdom, um, cows, some um, 
dogs and other animals is very toxic. And people, you get a slow accumulation because excretion is so slow. And when we were doing our research on solanines, this was pre-autoimmune paleo and other things, we found that using the indicators we were with our testing, if we found solanines were an issue and we took people off, we saw a lot of things clear up, a lot of chronic pain. My hip external rotation increased probably 70 degrees when I went off. Um, and so we were wondering if there was something to do to increase excretion of solanines. And um, we tested lots of different things. And, and this was, again, one of our few multi-ingredient products. We found that the ingredients in um, Therasupreme, which is a great antioxidant, but those specific ingredients tended to negate solanine on an applied kinesiology evaluation. When we started giving it, people who were solanine sensitive did respond very favorably. We don't recommend that people use it as an excuse to eat um, nightshades if they're sensitive. But if they have to, it might um, lessen the effect. And for people who, uh, and there's so many hidden nightshades. When you buy a hot dog, you know, one of the ingredients is paprika, or so many things that say spices on the label, and there might be paprika or red pepper or who knows what in there. Um, the herb ashwagandha, I, I typically do not give that to solanine sensitive people because it is a solanine. There are occasionally people who tolerate it because the ashwagandha is a root and there's not much solanine in the root as far as we know, but I typically would rather go with something like an albizia or so forth. Um, Carrie also asked if the solanine sensitivity will remain for life in people. Not necessarily. If you can fix their um, increased intestinal permeability, if you can increase their oral tolerance, if you can get their phase one and phase two liver detoxification working better, there's a good chance that they'll be able to tolerate solanines in small to moderate amounts, but not everybody. I, um, the, you know, the tendency toward it does run in families, but again, it doesn't necessarily give you a sentence that you have to have it. If you do everything else right to lower your total load, it might be you know, not enough to tip the scales. Um, I just had a question that went away. What are some, since I know one thing a lot of people, <laughs> I'm not sure what's- Sorry, Sam, about. we're not gonna talk about that. Um, what are some tidbits with Supreme and in general that you see with dealing with um, Lyme patients? Hints, tips, anything that you've found? If, if, no, if someone hasn't seen our, um, our YouTube, you know, if you go on YouTube and you, you type in Gifford Journey, it's, uh, it was done by the mother of three teenage patients of ours that were disabled with Lyme disease and um, Kind of their whole restoration, even though before us they'd spent how much money did they spend, Noah? It was a couple, two hundred thousand, three. It was a lot of. I mean, it was one clinic was like ninety grand, so I think it was like two or three hundred thousand. Um, the tip with Lyme patients is their supplements can change very, very frequently. Um, if you are a practitioner that does some type of energetic testing and you have room in your schedule and they can afford it, I would, I would test them multiple times a week. You know, occasionally their body likes to take a break from antimicrobials or might switch from one to another. Their body might want to take some detox products at some time. Sometime they might want to take a biofilm degrader and sometimes they, they don't. It just depends on their state of the body at the moment, you know, and all the other variables. So in those patients, the more they're in the office, the better they, they do. Uh, that's probably the biggest tip there. Um, you know, I don't, I, I just go by my findings. Um, there was a, a doc, there were some people, we had a lot of requests, can you, can you just make a Lyme package and sell it, you know, online? So here's the thing that everyone with Lyme disease buys and it has these, you know, 10 different pills in it. And, you know, my answer was, I personally can't do it. 
because all of my patients are different and their things change too often. And a lot of sensitive patients, if they take something that they don't need that day, they're going to have some type of reactivity that might cause some symptoms. You know, they might say, oh, that's great. I'm really going through a Herx reaction and they're not there. You know, they might just be going through a sensitivity reaction to something. Because if you take an antimicrobial that you don't need, it's a pretty strong thing. It has alkaloids, it has saponins, it has tannins in it often. And if your body doesn't want that to do a specific thing, um, you might end up with some type of symptom, be it a headache or a gastrointestinal upset or brain fog, or it might put you, you know, to sleep in the middle of the day. So um, I don't like to guess with it. I just like to see them off. And we have a, um, we have a family coming in a couple of weeks that we're going to do the same thing. It might be the first COVID exemption for the state of Hawaii for patients coming in, but um, so we're kind of anxious to do it again and we'll be reporting back. Um, if you had to say, what are probably your, in for your clientele, which I know can obviously is different than other people's, what are probably your top four products that you use and why do you use them? Malia is my favorite antimicrobial by far. Um, I'd say Vidanga is my second favorite. In terms of antimicrobials, um, I love using Takasumi for its detoxification properties. Um, Kamu, it's, you know, both antihistaminic. It's a, you know, in terms of vitamin C from a whole source, you know, it's very good. You have to be really wary of vitamin companies. One thing I encourage you to do, especially if you're a practitioner, you know, start pulling bottles off your shelf and read the part that says other ingredients. Like there's one company that claims to be whole food nutrition, but if you get their vitamin C product, you know, and, and it might have some carrot in it and some buckwheat or who knows, you know, just some different things. But then when you read the other ingredients, you know, one of the top other ingredients in there is ascorbic acid, which usually comes from GMO corn. So how is that whole food nutrition giving pharmaceutical ascorbic acid. You know, it's not. What it is is it's, it's low potency pharma, far, you know, low potency chemical vitamins in a whole food base. You know, so you have to watch it because some people are deceitful in marketing. You know, just like you go to the, you know, store and it says no sugar and they put erythritol and, you know, every other kind of sugar alcohol there is in the product. You know, so be able to read labels. You know, if it has steric acid, calcium stearate, magnesium stearate, realize that you're not going to get optimal absorption, that those are used as lubricants, but at the same time, they coat the contents and they limit absorption. You know, if you have propylene glycol in there, is, is that something you really want? If you use a tincture, you know, tinctures change the, the natural ratio in a product. Plus, if it's not organic alcohol, it could be grain-based. It might have some residual gluten. It might be from GMO corn if it's not organic alcohol. You know, they don't have to tell you that. You know, if you're using a standardized extract, what kind of um, petrochemicals re were used in the refining process that you might have some residual substance or even the energetics of it? I mean, you, you know, there's so much stuff that goes on that either the people who sell to you don't tell you because they're unaware of it, you know, but, um, you know, the more you delve into it, having, again, worked in the vitamin industry for so long, you know, scorbyl palmitate and leucine are also used as lubricants. They're not as bad, in my opinion, as steric acid, but they still, if you're taking five different ingredients with leucine in it, are you, you know, throwing your amino acid balance off because you're getting way more leucine with not, you know, many of, of the other essential you know, the other amino acids, you know, just different things to know. We had one more question. This will probably be the last one. It's a really good one from Paul. Um, what warning do you give a patient about die-off, detox reactions, et cetera, from treatment? I say that in 98% of my patients, you're not going to get a detox reaction. Because again, a lot of what people call detox reactions are more improper supplementation or too 
aggressive supplementation. Um, what I see more often than anything else in my patients, if I have to remove caffeine from their diet, is caffeine withdrawal reactions, which could be vomiting, could be headaches, could be about anything. So I do warn people of that, and I give them the option of doing it slowly or doing it all at once. And you know, some people have, can have a bad two weeks if they're extreme cases. I say if around day three or day four, you're feeling bad and it, you know, if it only lasts a day, it might be a detox reaction because usually we're, co we're covering so many bases in the work that we do. We're taking them off of inflammatory foods. We're pulling out metals. We're, we're treating different reflexes to um, enhance their body's response. You know, we're doing so many different things and we're lowering their total load so much that also minimizes the chance of detox reaction because their body can just handle things better. And, you know, we're, we're screening people when we test them, you know, do they need something like Shazandra for liver support or some other things. We tend to have most bases covered. Well, we do say if that reaction that starts on day three or day four stays for a couple of days, if you have the ability to come in and we'll see, you know, maybe you're, you don't need a supplement as long as we thought, or maybe there's something else going on that we missed on our initial exam. So, you know, we might just have them come in. And I'd say probably of that one to two percent, if you actually do get like a real die-off her time reaction, the majority of those times is caused by the BFB oils. And you could do Takasumi or Kamu to quench things if you really want. If you have if there's any other questions, we have about 30 more seconds. Otherwise, is there anything else that you wanted to cover or tell people? No, we could do it another time. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. If you do have questions, please feel free to email us and we'd be happy to answer anything. Also, if you have any specific topics you'd like a future webinar on, any, anything, just please let us know. Also, we're always open product suggestions and anything along those lines. But thank you for joining us today. I will be uploading this to YouTube. So please, if you have any, want to rewatch it or share it with friends, I'll be getting that up in the next day or two. But otherwise, thank you very much for joining us today. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank, thank you, everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you.